Uh, when I was a little kid, you, you would commonly hear it called Ju Jupiter II. And actually, the names date from the time just after when uh, Galileo discovered them. But Galileo came up with the idea of calling them Jupiter I, Jupiter II, III, IV. And uh, that <coughs> stuck until we started finding lots and lots and lots of Jupiter satellites. And now it would be like Jupiter VIII or something else, or the sun, and forth on the planet. So why is there this intense interest in Europa? Well, I'm going to go through that, but it's clearly biological. It's, we think it has an ocean. I'll describe, I hope, you know, clearly why we think that. And if you have an ocean, do you have life? Maybe. Um, and it also seems to have, it has two things that I'll keep coming back to. It has an ocean that's been there for the whole planet's history, most likely. And it has an ocean that, to some degree, communicates with the surface. Does not bury under hundreds of kilometers of uh, ice. So here's from uh, the uh, uh, Voyager spacecraft, uh, the Galileo spacecraft. More or less the scale, Jupiter. See the red spots actually bigger than our planet. And you have going outwards Eo, Europa, Ganymede, and Callisto. Mm -hmm. And you have a bunch of small stuff that you know. We're not going to deal with it all tonight. Um, <clears throat> you'll notice that all four of these planets, or moons, are quite different. Uh, Callisto, before Voyager, people thought these moons are all going to be dead. They're, just gonna, they're too small. They're the size of our moon are smaller. They're not going to have really any geological interest. There was actually people who said, oh, Voyager doesn't even need a camera because we don't, you know, we'll just see more pictures of craters. Well, they were wrong. <laughs> Callisto looks sort of like the moon. It's not, but it looks all like it. It's got lots of craters. Ganymede has some old parts to it, old surfaces, but lots of new surfaces. Eo and Europa are almost entirely new surfaces. So just to scale, our home planet, of course, our moon, Europa's a little smaller than our moon. So, yes, the pre-Voyager the pre -voyager planning people, you know, they weren't, I mean, it's not that, it sounds sensible. If our moon is dead, really, and doesn't have a lot going on, why would you expect Europa to have a lot going on? Well, you know, as any real estate broker would tell you, location matters, and Europa's in a good location. We were discovered by Galileo, who actually published it very quickly. He didn't always publish quickly. He actually proposed that same year that these satellites could be used as a chronometer and be used to solve the longitude problem. In other words, to do longitude, you need a good clock. He said, ah, at least that's three o'clock. And he actually designed this helmet thing that you could wear in sort of like an astro lab or a Joby lab or whatever to look at the satellites from a ship, but it didn't really work out. Um, but because of that, there was lots of observations of the satellites. There was, a, you know, any time back then, there was a nautical application, uh, an idea that you could use it for navigation, you could get money from your government, just like nowadays you can get money from the government for GPS satellites, well back then you could get money from the government to look at the uh, the lunar orbit, look at the um, orbits of these satellites. So there's lots of data. And, a, and a, an astronomer in 1675, I believe he's Danish, named Ole Roma, I'm sure I mangled that, um, used the timing of the eclipses. The eclipses are very good because you can see one satellite being blocked out by another, so you can time that. And he found that, gee, when, the, when Jupiter is closer to the Earth, when it's near um, opposition, the eclipses run fast when it's far from the Earth, when it's near, um, what would it be? Or when it's near conjunction, rather, superior conjunction, the eclipses run fast. When it's near opposition, when it's on the other side, they run slow. Why would that be? There's a speed of light. Now, his estimate wasn't really that good. It's off by about a factor of a third. But it's not, as far as I know, that was the first actual hard determination of the speed of light. Um, and, and, and the end of the 1700s, beginning of 1800s, Pierre Simon Laplace published his monumental Mechanique Celeste, which was five volumes or something like that. And so it had, you know, everything, you know, astronomy up to that time in it. And he didn't give a lot of references, and so a lot of people thought it was all his. Well, some of it was his, but it wasn't all his. Um, but he talked about what we now call the Laplace resonance. All right, so this is Galileo. I tried to find his lab notebook pictures of this, which are actually kind of interesting, but I couldn't. But this is from the Starry Messenger, and you know, this is where he said, I see these things the first night I saw three, the second night I saw four. 
Um, that's generally considered to be the discovery of, of Europa. Because presumably in the first one, Europa and Io were, were blended together. They're actually quite close. So the Laplace resonance, well, what is that exactly? Well, if you look at the time <coughs> here of the, of the, if Io, you know, does one revolution, well, in the time that Ganymede does one revolution, Io will do four and Europa will do two. So you have nearly two to one resonances between both Io and Europa and Europa and Ganymede. And that's actually pretty, pretty determinant for the system. And you also have the fact that the, la the longitudes of the system sum to about 180. Or to put it another way, Ganymede, Europa, and Io are never on the same side of Jupiter and aligned together. When two are close, one's going to be either on the opposite side of Jupiter or it's going to be uh, 120 degrees away. So either 180 or 120. So, so they sum to this 180 as opposed to summing to zero. They never can sum to zero. All right, so, a little science fiction here. The scene at the, at the end of 2001 where they see the four moons all lined up together, can't happen. <laughs> yeah, I know. Um, and so that just states this. So that means that the gravitational, what this basically is is a way of getting gravitational energy from EO out to Europa and Ganymede. The, the resonances mean that these, and the resonances are a little more complicated than that previous equation. The, the eccentricity is in, included in two, and that pumps up the eccentricity of these bodies. So, and normally you would think, oh, okay, the eccentricity, if you have a big tidal forcing, the eccentricity is going to be driven to zero. Tidal forcing requires energy, that energy is going to come from the orbit, and that means the eccentricity will get smaller and smaller, and eventually be zero, and you'll have something like Pluto Charon, where everything is zero. You know, in Pluto Charon, the eccentricity is zero, the inclination is zero, the liquidity is zero, the, um, um, and, the, and the rotations are both locked. So there's not a way, easy way to extract gravitational energy from the orbit for Pluto Charon. And so Pluto and Charon are both quite cold, okay, it's near the surface. With Io and Ganymede and Europa, that doesn't happen. And so you have this thing where Jupiter, Io has a, has a 0.3%, I think it is, eccentricity. I'm sorry, Europa has a 0.3% eccentricity. And that means it's moving in and out of the, the Jovian gravitational field. And as it's moving, it's getting squished. And squishing is a form of energy. And that heats up the, the interior. And that's why it has an ocean. Um, so that wasn't recognized in the 70s. And you could say maybe it should have been, but you know, hey. I was around then, I didn't think of it, so, you know. Uh, it wasn't obvious, and there was a lot of, you know, there was a lot of debate about, like, would you would see anything or whatever, and then you had a couple of interesting, three interesting things happen, all right, and they all happened in March of 1979. In March 2nd of 1979, there was a paper that came out in this journal Science that was entitled The Melting of Eel by Tidal Death dissipation. And that was by um, Steve Peel. And my understanding is that Peel sort of moved heaven and earth to get the paper to appear before the next event, which was the March 5th um, uh, encounter of Voyager 1 and EO. Because he thought they would see something. So he wanted to make sure his paper actually appeared in press before, you know, so it would be a prediction instead of a retrodiction. And so yeah, my understanding is, I don't know this, I mean, this is just sort of second hand, but he actually talked to the editor and said, please, 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 move it up. And it happened. And then, on March 9, 1979, Linda Morbido, who I actually knew, no, um, went to work. And her job at JPL was spacecraft and optical navigation. So, to do a, how do you do optical navigation? Well, this was actually the first real intensive use of optical navigation. You basically take pictures, but you take pictures with long time exposure so you can see stars. They were going down to like fourth magnitude or something like that. So, um, you, you know, they had some stars that were, you know, they had picked out in advance and said, okay, we want to see how long well, or whatever. I don't know which stars they were. But she's, gonna, she's looking through every one of these pictures to see all the stars there, how far they were from the limb of the body. If you have a, a picture of the moon and a picture of a star and you get the distance between the limb and the star, you, you know, you know where, if you know where the moon is, you know where you are better. And what did she see? Well, this is what she saw. 
Um, high exposure, so you can actually see some, this is Jupiter shine on the left here, that's why you can see that. And there's actually two weird things here. There's this arc here. Now this is before Star Wars. Now they should think, ah, oh, it's the Death Star. Uh, she thought, is there a moon that they didn't know about? And thinking about it for a little bit, like, no, you're not going to hide. I mean, you know, this is, this is uh, 3,000 kilometers across or something like that. You're not going to hide, what would that be, a 200 kilometer moon near Jupiter. You're just not, not going to hide it. And then there's also this spot here, which is not, you know, on the wrong side of the Terminator. Well, she discovered the, the, the uh, she had discovered the, uh, the volcanoes of Eo. She had discovered what Peel had just predicted, you know, a week beforehand. And notice, she didn't, you know, this was not through the PI track. This is not like, oh, we have a special, you know, volcano-looking um, uh, group of scientists. No, this is just normal. Um, optical navigation. But she got paper and science out of it, so that's not bad if it's going to work. Um, so Pia was triumphantly vindicated. The Galilean satellites were probed. You know, they're obviously not cold dead worlds. And in fact, three of them, the inner three, were found to be really active worlds with fresh surfaces. Now, Voyager did, neither Voyager made an especially close pass of, uh, of Europa. They had good cameras. So they got some decent pictures, but nothing really close. This is about the best picture of Europa. It was from Voyager 2, so it was actually in July, I think, a little bit later. Um, and one of the things you notice is, if you, if you know anything about the solar system and how you date things, well, how do you, how do you date things? We date things with craters. You put a surface out there, a lava flow or something like that, and when it's fresh, there are no craters. <laughs> Over time, things hit it, and you get more and more craters. And then after a while, I, Four billion years, it looks like the highlands of the moon, where everything is craters. Over the surface of Verdun and World War One, everything is craters. They're just craters on top of craters. Well, you see any craters here? I mean, maybe that's a crater. They're not a lot, though. That's a pretty young surface. So Galileo, uh, when Galileo got to Europa, uh, got to Jupiter. Unfortunately, as you as you may remember, the uh, Galileo had a problem with it. Galileo had actually several problems. It had, it had the Challenger explosion, was the, the, the sort of root cause of all of this. Because of the Challenger explosion, they decided they were going to send Galileo on a Jupiter flyby because they couldn't use a shuttle to launch it. They had to use another spacecraft to launch. Or they couldn't use a shuttle to launch a Centaur. They couldn't put hydrogen fuel in a, in a shuttle to be launched. And so they decided we're going to use a smaller rocket, like a, a, an Agena or something like that. And that means we don't have enough delta V, which means we have to do another gravity assist, which means we have to go by Venus, which means we've got to put it closer to the sun. And they needed a little bit more in the computer system to take care of that. In the computer system I had, I believe, 41 separate functions it could do. And so they took one. And the one they took was to, um, they had a function to expand the antenna array, the, 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 the main antenna, and wanted to collapse it. So it's like an umbrella. Expand it, want to collapse it. They figured, well, we're never going to collapse it, so we'll just take that one away and we'll use it for another thing. And then, because the spacecraft had sat on the ground for five years, when they got into space, they couldn't open the antenna. They found out, oh, well, we can, we can try and run this motor to open it, but we really would like to try and close it, and we don't have that function because we took it and gave it something else. And so they never were able to get the antenna to open up, and that meant that out at Jupiter, they had a bit rate of something like 10 bits a second. Because they were using the low, the high gain, the low gain antenna, the omnidirectional antenna that's stuck on the spacecraft for doing flybys, you know, and for you know just after launch. And so, yeah, they got pretty pictures back, but they didn't get a lot. And so they got this is a mosaic. This is, um, I believe, um, the Jupiter facing side of Europa. And you can see all these lines here, all the stretch marks. What are they? You know, we don't actually still really don't know. And some some features. Let's look at it another way. Um, so Europa has. Oops, sorry. Um, two sides. 
the way to think of it is as a leading side and trailing side, it's locked into orbit with Jupiter. So it has one side that always faces Jupiter. Okay, so it's just like our moon. So as it's rotating around, it has a side in the direction it's going, that's the leading side, it has the opposite side. This is actually the trailing side, and we'll get to why that's significant in a minute. You can see there's one nice looking crater there. So it's not incredibly old, but you see the, all these ridges. The ridges actually look so amazingly sometimes, like they're freeways or something. You know, like they're, you know, uh, it was built to send traffic. Um, there's this chaos terrain, which we're going to get to again, you know, which just looks messy. Looks kind of like it was broken up, sort of like an ice wall almost, it was broken up and then put back together. And in fact, the chaos terrain is one of the reasons we think the, the, the ice shell is not that deep, because otherwise, why would you get this stuff, you know? So here's a blow up of the, of the ridges. You have these bands, which are kind of like ridges, but they don't have any, um, uh, what do you call it? Uh, any, they don't appear to have any shadows, and so they don't appear to have any elevation to them, so they're flat. Um, most of these things, you know, are not really very really well understood. There's theories, but it uh, doesn't necessarily mean they're accurate theories. So, Leading hemisphere, trailing hemisphere. There's more of this red junk, whatever it is, on the trailing hemisphere than the leading hemisphere. The red junk is presumably some sort of tholin, which is um, a result of taking organic material and exposing it to high energy radiation for a long period of time. So you just cook it by you know, impacting with the MEV electrons in this case. Why is it like this? Why the trailing hemisphere? Well. The, all of this is driven by the Jupiter's magnetosphere. And the Jupiter magnetosphere is frozen in and rotates with the planet. And so the moon is rotating every 3.55 days or something like that. And so it's actually going slowly, but the, the planet itself is rotating every 10 hours, 9.95 hours. And so it's actually the, the trailing hemisphere that's being bombarded by radiation, not the leading hemisphere. Um, well, not quite. But that's why it's red on the trailing hemisphere. The trailing hemisphere is what's getting it. The trailing hemisphere is where it's cooked, being, getting cooked. Unfortunately, there are also high energy protons, and high energy protons tend to hit on the leading hemisphere. <clears throat> as far as I can tell, and people have looked into this, there's no spot in Europe where you can say, ah, if we landed there, there's no radiation. It's like this kind and that kind, but you know. Um, I mean, that obviously should be tested, but it doesn't seem like there's any, any miracle here. This just describes what I just, I you know, told you. <clears throat> and this is a pictorial thing. So Jupiter, the magnetic field lines, these bands here are the flux tubes. That's another cool thing about this space. There's, at any one instant, terawatts. There's about 10 terawatts going through this one, and about one terawatt going through this one. And I believe the entire electrical generation capacity of the Earth is three terawatts, something like that. So there's you know, that gives you a scale on how much energy there is flowing through these flux tubes that are connecting <coughs> these moons to the aurora of Jupiter. All right? And if you're interested in this, here's another thing where there's actually some cool stuff that amateurs can do. The flux tubes control the decametric radiation from, from Jupiter. And in fact, what happens is their Jupiter the things spiral in, they're soft relativistic, not hard relativistic, so they're doing these wide spirals, and so there's a cone, a fairly wide cone, 30 degrees or something like that, not uh, 60 degrees, where the radiation is put out on the, the radio, and so when that cone intersects the Earth, when it illuminates the Earth, you get a very, very strong uh, decometric radiation from, from uh, Jupiter. And there's this thing called Project Jove, um, I mean, it's strong enough that it was discovered in Maryland by when people with a dipole antenna had the antenna system saturate. Jupiter was literally saturating the receiver. They're trying to figure out what's saturating our receiver, you know. And then they noticed, oh, it's, changing. it's doing it on a serial basis. It's, you know, four minutes earlier each day. It's something in the sky. And, um, and it was Jupiter. And, uh, but Project Joe, you can look online. 
search for that. And they, they describe how you can take like just some simple dipoles. Now you need something like you know 30 feet, 10 meters of dipole. So you need a fairly large backyard. But you have a fairly large backyard, you can build your own telescope, and you can see Jupiter. And it's actually really easy to pick up. So this is the Hubble. I believe the insults are in ultraviolet, but they're showing you the aurora. And this is uh, this is the aurora at night, so this is purely auroral flux. I believe this is also UV. And you can see there's an oval. And this looks sort of like the Earth's aurora. I mean, there's an aurora oval on Earth, too. Except that there are these spots that are the end of the flux tube coming from the... Um, the, the moon. You can see that the EO flux tube footprint is much brighter than Ganymede and Europa, but they're all there. Um, now, you might think, well, okay, what does that have to do with biology? It actually has something to do with at least our understanding of these moons. Jupiter has this very strong magnetic field, and it's inclined about 10% to the um, rotation axis of Jupiter. And remember, the moon's orbit, you know, in that rotation axis plane, right? So Jupiter's like the sun, you know, there's a, an ecliptic, if you would, except it's the Jupiter rotation plane. And um, um, so just like the Earth has a north magnetic pole, which is not actually at the North Pole, but I believe somewhere in, in Hudson Bay right now, Jupiter has a north magnetic pole, which is not on its North Pole either, but about 10 degrees off. <laughs> and whether that moves around, we don't really know, but it probably does. Um, but that means that at Europa, you have this field that's flopping up and down once a Jupiter day. You know, as Jupiter's rotating around, it's going up and down, actually twice a Jupiter day. And so, imagine you then have a liquid ocean in Europa that's with water. Well, we know that water with a little bit of salt doesn't take much, much less than our ocean. Even, I mean, water on Earth is basically always conductive because it's got enough salt. So even fresh water, you know, you shouldn't, like, you know, fill your bathtub with fresh water and put, put a uh, radio or something in it because you'll get electrocuted because it's conducting. But it's conducting because it's got a little bit of salt in it. It doesn't take much. Or pure distilled water is not that good a conductor, but real water tends to be. All right, so what happens? Well, a conducting shell, even a thin conducting shell, won't allow a magnetic field to penetrate. How does that, you know, how does that, I mean, that's Maxwell's equations, but how does that actually work? Well, it sets up a countervailing field. And if the exterior field is linear, or straight, if the field lines are straight, and you know, Europa is far enough from Jupiter, this is a big enough scale, that, and the scale of its size, over 3,000 kilometers or whatever, the field is straight to a very good approximation, Europa, you know, the, the body will set up a dipole field. And so that means if you fly a spacecraft near this, and you can have a good model for the Jupiter field, and you subtract that off, you say, ah, there's a dipole field here. That dipole field is an evidence of an ocean. Now, you know, it could be some other conducting thing, like it could be a metallic core, but you can also say, well, like, for example, how far away are we from the, from the, from the dipole? Um, how deep is it? And the trouble with Europa is we know the density, and so if you said this is a metallic core, you get a density that's way too high. Too much metal, so it's got to be something like water, and water is the only thing we know that will that will fit the bill. And the Galileo spacecraft measured such a dipole for Europa and Callisto, so that presumably they have oceans. Even Callisto, which is all battered and beat up, presumably has an ocean. Its ocean is thought to be about 250 kilometers deep. That's pretty deep. We're not going to be going down there anytime soon. Now Ganymede is also thought to have an ocean, but Ganymede also has an intrinsic magnetic field, sort of like the Earth. And so that's all different, but I'm not going to get into that. So because of this work, because we know the density of, of Europa, because we know something about what it's made of, and because we know this magnetic field fluctuates, and we know the depth of it, you get an image sort of like this. There is some sort of metallic core, not a very big one, but some sort of metallic core, a silicate uh, interior mantle, sort of like our mantle, a, a liquid ocean, and then a fairly thin shell. So here's a blow up of that. And, you know, of course, what the interior, what the upper side of the shell looks like, we have really no idea. I mean, that's something we might hope to find out in the orbiter. But, uh, so, 
um, you know, on Earth. This got people really excited when this was when this was figured out. On Earth, whenever you have a lot of water, you have life. Okay. So, like for example, the liquid water. So, like for example, in deep under Texas, there's an aquifer that's miles down, and they drill down the you know, take the water from that aquifer, and they find there's stuff down there. There's bacteria, there's even little fish and stuff that come up. Uh, there's, there's some sort of life going on down there, you know, four miles down or something like that. Um, you know, it's um, lakes in uh, Antarctica, these, these lakes underneath the ice that we think have life, now that's still an open question, but, you know, it seems likely there's, you know, places like um, the Dead Sea, for example, is for a long time thought to be lifeless, but actually there's some bacteria that live in it. So it really does seem to be a rule on Earth that if you have water, you're going to have life. Well, Europa is thought to have lots of water, and in fact, this is just taking the models, and for the Earth, we have, of course, a pretty good idea of how much surface water there is, because it's in the ocean, we can model those, match those, and taking the water depth for Europa, and just turning it into a ball of water. We see the, bigger, the ball for Europa is bigger than the ball for the Earth. Now, well, factor of two, I don't know, but clearly they are the same order of magnitude. And so, that says there's actually a lot, you know, a lot of space there for biology. All right, so how would you drive such a biology? You know, on Earth, most biology is driven by sunlight. You know, go outside, there's grass, Something eats that grass, you know, something eats the something that eats the grass. We eventually eat the something that eats the something that eats the grass. That's how our biology lives. Now, okay, maybe you get a fish, but that salmon was feeding on plankton, and that plankton was either itself, you know, running photosynthesis or eating something else it was, so on and so forth. Until fairly recently, in fact, it was thought that all biology on Earth ran that way. You're either eating something that's directly growing as a green thing, vegetable or whatever, or you're eating something that ate that, or maybe you're eating something that was a vegetable and it was lying around for a while. And then, um, again, a serendipitous discovery. Uh, we found these things called black smokers in the ocean. And that's just descriptive. The water that comes out is black. This is, I believe, about 500 C. But because it's under such pressure, you're something like you know, four miles down in the ocean, it can't boil. It's just coming out. Now, all this, it's full of stuff. It's full of um, minerals of various sorts, sulfides and, you know, and actually metals. And as soon as it hits the cold water, all that drug gets dropped out. It just can't, it can't maintain it. it. You know, it can't be dissolved when it gets cold. And so that's why it looks black. It comes out and immediately gets cold, cool down, and you get all this stuff coming out. And there's actually biologies that live off of these, off of the impact, off of the you know, emanations, the, the, the minerals and whatnot, coming out of these black smokers. And I might point out, also, right here, this crust here, I said there are metals in here. The metals get deposited almost immediately and they form a crust. If much later, you know, say this happened a billion years ago, then um, the ocean might rise up, become dry land, it might get covered over sedimentation, it might go into a place like, say, Nevada. When you hear about people going in, um, uh, like a gold mine in Nevada, and finding a mother load of gold or of silver or something like that, and they find these big nuggets and all like that, that's what it really is. It's an old black smoker or something analogous from a long time ago that got covered over with sedimentation and then went through the usual geological mill of uh, plate tectonics brought up to dry land, and now somebody's digging and, you know, getting the gold out of it. So, ingredients for life. And, and these are the, the tube worms that are very common down there. And they also filter out, I think it's sulfides that are coming up in those black smokers, and they live, and they, you know, and so these things eat these things, and so on and so forth, in the usual fashion. So, Europa has water. Europa has all the elements that the Earth does. Europa has chemical energy coming up from below, from the, presumably from the heating from tides, and Europa has been there for four billion years or, or so. We, the models tend to show that the Europa oceans would form early, 
and last until the present. Europe would never go through a frozen state. Um, so, that, this knowledge has been percolating sort of through the scientific system or the scientific community for a while now. And in one of these weird things that happens, oh, not weird, but one of these things that just seems to happen sometimes, fairly recently a bunch of people have been saying, you know, we really should be investigating this. And actually, I've been in, I was involved with the Mar I have been involved with the Mars community. I was actually part of the Viking program, believe it or not. Um, and the um, the cultural difference is quite different. On Mars, everybody's very cautious, and since Viking, they got burned so bad that they're not really interested in doing biological tests. There've been no biological tests since Viking on Mars. So we say we're going to look for life on Mars, but we actually haven't <coughs> looked at all since the 70s. Um, but in Europa and other ocean worlds, it's like, oh, we should be doing this immediately. <laughs> and the U.S. Congress actually has mandated that, that not only did NASA fly a mission to Europa, which I'll call the Europa Clipper, which I'll get into, but also that they should do a lander. And in fact, they originally mandated that the lander should go with the Europa Clipper, and that sort of freaked a lot of people out, because the Europa Clipper is more or less built, or at least not built and designed, the lander is just kind of sketched out. So if you couple the two together, you're going to lay the cover for sure. And I think that word got back to Congress, and so now they've backed up on that. And ESA is also considering a mission to Europa. What well, has a mission to the Jupiter moons that's going to line up on Ganymede, but it's also considering something specific here for Europa. And the Russians are also considering something. So let's talk about, start with the, the next one. This mission is almost certainly going to fly. I don't know if it's it's still a proposed mission, but it's it's got a lot of institutional weight behind it. It's called the Multiple Flyer Mission, which you'll also hear it called as the Europa Clipper. All right, so this is the current version of it. So you have this radar. This is a long wave radar. The ice is fairly transparent to waves that are longer than about 10 meters. And so the idea is you might use 100 meters here, and you look through the ice, and maybe you look all the way down to the ocean. Well, that depends on how deep it is, but at least you could say, but it's deeper than such and such an amount. All right. This has been flown from Mars. It works really well on Mars. Um, I don't know if you've seen any of the pictures of the Mars polar caps, but they, they can see all the way. The Mars polar caps are like four or five kilometers thick. You can see all the way down to the bedrock. So you can see all these layers in the polar caps. Really phenomenal stuff. Um, there's magnetometer, because a lot of this magnetic induction stuff should be done better. Um, and there's various other, you know, there's a camera and so on and so forth. What there's not is a LIDAR. And we won't have a chance to get to that. That's unfortunate, but uh, so be it. So this is my take on the scientific goals. I have a scientific goals document which has lots of them, but these are the two crucial ones for me. One is to better characterize the ocean. How thick is it? Is it more or less uniform, or is it deeper in certain areas, so on and so forth? Um, what can we say about the ice? You know, what can we say about the stuff on top of the ice? So that we call that sort of oceanography. And then the second one is to find places for the lander to land. And this is actually something a lot of people don't appreciate. Because the Galileo spacecraft didn't have a lot of bandwidth, it didn't take a lot of pictures of, of Europa. In fact, at the time it was going to take the best pictures, it had a problem, and like a safe mode or something, and it didn't take any pictures. And so we don't have a lot of good pictures of Europa close up. So we don't know where we should put a lander right now. And so the Europa Clipper, one of its prime jobs is to figure out, okay, where would be a good, you know, it's the usual thing of, we want a safe place, we want an exciting place. Well, exciting places tend not to be safe. <laughs> safe places tend not to be exciting. We've got to find some happy medium. But, you know, at least we'll have pictures in, of the surface and descriptions of the surface, and so we have a much better idea once this flies of where a lander should actually land. Clipper, not a Europa orbiter. Jupiter, JPL actually went through a lot of trouble to design a whole Europa orbiter mission, which was about, I think, $3 billion more than the Clipper. Well, I mean, the reason is because of the money. But why? Well, for one thing, you have to have more rocket power to you know, go into Europa orbit. That's like a three, four uh, kilometer per second delta V burn you got to do. So, and it's expensive to carry rocket fuel to Jupiter. So, you know. By cutting out that rocket, they cut out some, some of the cost. There's also a planetary protection issue. 
The plan planetary protection in this case is not protecting us from them, but them from us. They are becoming more and more an issue at NASA in that, you know, they say, you've got to sterilize your spacecraft before you send them to a place like Europa. Well, sterilization of a spacecraft is expensive. It takes time and it takes money. And so, there's this feeling we don't want to do the planetary protection. If you're in orbit around Jupiter, you can always, you can always arrange that the last part of your mission is to dive into Jupiter, and then you're gone. And that's what the Clipper is going to do. That's what Juno spacecraft is going to do. That's what Galileo did. That's what Cassini is about to do next year. Right? Get rid of the spacecraft, put it into the big, big planet where it burns up on re-entry or entry, and you don't have to worry about planetary protection as much. They still worry about it, but not as much. If you leave it orbiting Europa, eventually that's not a stable orbit. There's no stable orbit orbiting Europa because of the Jovian gravitational perturbations. Eventually it will have a good chance of impacting the surface, and you might contaminate it. But the real problem is radiation. It's hard to get your head around the radiation environment on these moons. In, inside in EO, the radiation is supposed to be sometimes a rad per second. Now, a rad is something like, you know, bad for human. You can survive it, but it's bad. <laughs> so that means you've got a second. <laughs> Five seconds, something like that. It's a little better in Europa, but it's not a lot better. And you might think, well, okay, so you're not going to send people there in the near future. You got all it actually, the electronics that we fly, the radiation hardened electronics, I did this calculation for Europa, would last without any protection something in less than a day. So a long time to be gone, a short time to be there, you want to last longer than a day. And Juno, for example, had a big, I think it's titanium vault, they call it, to put the critical electronics in to protect it from radiation. Juno, all, but all of these probes, also, all these missions also now have orbits to keep them out of the radiation as much as possible. So this kind of gives the idea. You put the thing in an inclined orbit, the radiation, as it turns out, is really confined to the equatorial plane of Jupiter, which is where the moons are orbiting in, and so you you incline it, and so you spend most of your time out, and then occasionally you pass through it. Uh, Juno is doing this right now. Uh, you know, it's spending two hours close to Jupiter with lots of radiation, and then it's spending, well, right now, 53 days is the orbital period. You know, so 52 of those days, well away from Jupiter, so it's not getting radiated. And this shows you the top is 3.5 rads per second behind an inch of aluminum. So that's pretty bad, you know. <laughs> and uh, uh, the Europa is sort of down here where you're, you know, you might, it might take you a, an hour to get a field dose. The NASA slide, it talks about the ocean and ice shell, the reconnaissance, our reconnaissance here. This is, I believe, the closest image we have of Europa, the highest resolution, 500 meters. So even this is not good enough. And this is some of the chaos terrain, too. And uh, the composition, we'd like to know more about composition. This mission will almost certainly not, thank you, find life. It will, however, likely go on an SLS direct to Jupiter. That saves five years. And they like to show this graph. Basically, each flyby is a close approach. The orbit has been carefully designed. The, the blue and red is when data are going to be collected. The orbit has been carefully designed so the whole body will be covered by these close approaches. So, um, even though you're not orbiting Europa, it's almost as good as if you were. So let's talk a little bit about the Europa lander. Um, and I don't know if you remember the sky crane, which sort of gave me the heebie-jeebies when, when Mars Science Laboratory was going to... Well, it worked! And so, the sky crane is likely to be used for everything. <laughs> <laughs> um, and by the way, that's why I put image courtesy of uh, Robert Papalotto there, because he gave me this. So, you know, the JPL cops come after me. I just said, talk to Bob. Um, but the sky crane would land the lander down on the surface, and these panels would unfold, and there would be an arm here, which you can see would be extended, and it would do stuff, of course. Um, these are not solar panels. This would be actually powered, I believe, just by batteries. This is planning to be on the surface for 30 days. And actually, that's, I believe, dominated by the radiation. All right? So, an SLS, an SLS launch, which could get three people to the moon, 
um, would send this to Jupiter with a payload of 35 kilograms, which is all heavy luggage, and a total lander weight of maybe 300 kilograms, something like that. So, and the trouble is, you know, you have to do a lot of delta V at Jupiter, and that takes fuel, and you have to carry all that fuel from Earth, and so you have to have this big rocket, the usual thing of having a big rocket to get a smaller rocket to get a smaller rocket to get your actual payload where it needs to go. So, unlike Clipper, which is highly unlikely to find life, um, you, for the Europa lander, even the first one, as you see, goal one, search for evidence of life on Europa. I mean, there has not been a Martian mis mission that does this, at least a U.S. Martian mission, that has this as goal one, or any goal, since Viking. So that's 40 years. Um, and how would you do that? Well, you'd look, you know, you look for organic stuff, basically. You look for organic stuff in the surface. You look at any, any inorganic stuff, too. Look at the ice, you know? Try and figure out, you know, sample it and put it through a mass spectrometer. I mean, that's the big instrument, really. It's the mass spectrometer, gas chromatograph, something like that. Um, and you actually have a microscope, the hope, to look on the ice. Now, remember, the ice here contains stuff from the inside that was brought up. So it's been radiated by this radiation for a while. They're not likely to find anything that's still alive on the surface. Maybe a meter down, but not on the surface. Where might we land? Well, there's sort of two... Um, the, the, the primary candidate is the so-called chaos terrain. This is a model of what they think the chaos is. Down here is the ocean. This is warm ice that's, that's actually convective, and it's breaking up the surface as it does so. Or, as they call it, the lava land. <laughs> you know a lot like this, right? You know, you have heat from below, and the ice is coming up. Not water, but ice. But that ice is coming from somewhere. It's frozen ocean, so it might have critters in it. You know, like bacteria or fish or whatever might be in there. And so, that, you know, they're doing numerical models, and you can see sort of how this is supposed to work. I think. Here. You see how the plumes come up? I mean, this is actually not too different from the way our mantle makes volcanoes. So, this is a close picture of the chaos terrain. You can see why it's called that. It really does kind of look to me like an ice flow that's been broken up and then reassembled. You know, um, not a crater, it's not an impact event, but something has been mixing that up. So, maybe this is used to be the underside of the ice and you have, you have critters there. Now, I've actually been proposing this as an alternative. These domes here. These are about, average size is about nine kilometers. These spots, the, what do they call, lectilinear. Um, I think, and actually, people you know, who've been researching this thing, that these are actually chiral volcanoes. <coughs> these are things from the inside that get pushed up and then over time, relax and spread out. So they're, they're blobs of material. So it's, again, sort of like the chaos terrain, but in this case, the blob reaches all the way to the surface. It comes through the surface, comes up, and then it's warm, because it's from below, and so it, as it cools off, it has time to spread out and, and decline. And if you look at, I don't know if you can see the times there, but depending on your rheological models, it might take anywhere from a few months to a few decades. Could we find one of those being extruded? I actually think if we could, that would be a very good place to look for biology. And I'm going to just show this here, and I think I'll wind up with this. Here's the European plans. The Europeans kind of got burned by NASA because NASA was going to go with them on a mission, and then NASA pulled out. They didn't like that. And um, now that NASA has said, oh, we have this SLS launch coming, we might have spare payload capacity. Do you want to put something on it? They're kind of like, hmm. Dubious, but they have really a complementary plan. I mean, all the pieces I just described, they have their own version of, including a lander, which was actually designed with NASA, and it's a more conventional lander with legs, but you know, so what. And uh, let's see here. Oh, yes, I did want to show the penetrators. There's a different way to, sh I mean, their, their philosophy is you have a lander, you have an orbiter, you have a flyby. 
That's the flyby. You're applying your open flyby mission. You know, you got better determination of stuff. They have this little thing that's about the size of a pineapple. It would be the astrobiological wet laboratory. You literally throw it out on the ice, you know, do its thing and radio back. But this is my favorite here. The penetrator. <laughs> In fact, if you remember um, Jules Verne, you know, from the Earth to the Moon, it's an awful lot like the, the uh, Jules Verne. Uh, but basically, the idea would be you would throw these out from uh, maybe 30 kilometers up, and they would hit the surface at about 300 meters a second and into it. So, if you remember lawn darts, <coughs> that wonderful, you know, um, sort of educational toy. Uh, 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 you know, they're basically lawn darts on Europe. I love it. You know, what can I say? Um, and they've actually done tests. I mean, they have this rocket railgun that's firing this stuff into big blocks of ice and concrete, and it's surviving. And so, uh, hey, you know, I think it's cool. What can I say? Uh, and obviously, you're, you're trading off having a f one probe that does a lot of stuff from having lots of probes that do little things. But I think there's benefit to having both. So the U.S. NASA is to be really seriously thinking about all this stuff, and seriously in the sense of like, you know, millions are being spent to spend a few billion. Each one of these missions is going to be two or three billion. Um, and ESA is not far behind. Um, now, there may be other ocean worlds, I'm sure there are, I mean, Ganymede and Callisto, for example, Enceladus seems to be one, uh, but none of these others seem to have the two combinations of A, you have material that's brought to the surface, and B, it's lasted for a long time. It's really hard to see how Enceladus, which has plumes, so we know Enceladus has an ocean. We can see it spurting out into space. It's hard to see how Enceladus, a much smaller body, has been liquid for its entire life. It's <coughs> not in the right orbit. It does not get this kind of gravitational tidal forcing. It just doesn't. And so, you know, it's hard to see why Presumably Enceladus was hit by something or some other thing happened that caused the ocean to form recently, and the ocean's only 100 million years old, it may not have life. And so uh, Europa is, I really think, the best bet there. And of course, Titan has methane on the surface, but that's a different kind of life if it has life. It's not going to be carbon-based stuff like us. It'll be something else. Maybe carbon, but it's going to be something else, because it's just too cold. We use water as a solvent in our bodies, you know, that would have to use methane or ethane or something like that, and that's something we really don't understand at all. So, all right, so that's it. Thank you.